Ahoy, mateys! It's time to talk about the chlamydia species, and we're going to be talking about some pirates and their pirate ship. And it's a pretty good association, too, because if any group in history had rampant STIs, it was the pirates. And this video on chlamydia is called The Pirates of Clam Island. So there's a lot of information to learn about chlamydia, but we ambitiously thought we could tie it all into one story. But we'll still break it up and make it as simple as possible. So first we'll discuss the general characteristics, the life cycle, and identification. Then we'll move into several clinical presentations, and then finally finish with treatment. So let's get started. Here we have a small island with a pirate ship that is run aground. First let's go over some of the microbial characteristics. It's important to remember that chlamydia species is an obligate intracellular bacteria. In past drawings, we've associated being an obligate intracellular organism with an indoor scene. However, this would be kind of hard with the pirate ship. So we've demonstrated it slightly differently. We have this ship running aground, and it's stuck on an island. This round, white, sandy island represents the cell, and the ship is the bacteria that's stuck on the island. So that's obligate intracellular. The white island also signifies the lack of staining with a gram stain. This is very much similar to the rickettsia species, who are also obligate intracellular and demonstrate poor gram staining. And additionally, just like the rickettsia species, the reason why chlamydia is an obligate intracellular organism is because it can't create its own ATP. With all that's going to be discussed, there's no symbolism to depict that fact, but it should be pretty well ingrained following the rickettsia videos. Another interesting aspect about the cell wall of chlamydia that's frequently tested is the lack of muramic acid, which is a component of peptidoglycans that make up the cell wall. And we'll demonstrate this with the banner that hangs on the side of the ship. Muramic sounds like mermaid, which we thought would be a good way to remember this fact. So we'll have a sign that demonstrates that there are no mermaids or no muramic acids on board. The lack of muramic acid in the cell wall becomes important in terms of treatment options, which we'll discuss later. Okay, let's move on to the life cycle. And this will be demonstrated by these pearls and clamps. Essentially, there are two forms of the bacteria in its life cycle, elementary bodies and reticulate bodies. The beginning of the cycle is simple. We have the bacteria, which is the pearl, sitting outside of the cell, or the clam. What form is the pearl in now? Well, this is the first stage of the life cycle, so it's the elementary stage. Simple, right? Okay, now stage two is after the bacteria is inside the cell, or inside the clam, and as you can see, the clam is split into two, so we can see inside and that there are two pearls. And this form is called the reticular body, and it's how the bacteria multiply, through binary fission. The reticular body is known as the active form that can multiply something that the elementary body can't do. And the final stage is the release of these newly replicated bacteria out of the cell. And now again they're in their elementary form, and this cycle repeats. In short, the elementary body is the infectious form, and the reticular body is the active dividing form, or elementary enters and reticular replicates. Okay, now that we're done with that, Take note of these big piles of pink pearls scattered throughout the island. This is to represent the inclusion bodies that are seen under microscope in cells infected with chlamydia. Essentially, inclusion bodies are just bunches of reticulate bodies which are dividing in the cell. So I mentioned earlier that chlamydia can't be gram stained, but it can still be visualized under microscope. And that's because we use another stain. And it's a stain we've talked about before. It's called the Giemsa stain. We mentioned it in the Borrelia video. Remember Sir Giemsa was one of the competitors against Robin of Ixodes? Well, Giemsa comes into play here too. But in this story, we'll represent Giemsa, which to me looks a lot like the word gems, G-E-M-S, and we'll draw a treasure chest full of sparkling gems. And these are to remind you of the Giemsa stain. A treasure chest full of gems is a perfect fit into any pirate story, and it should serve you well to remember the Giemsa stain. Although you can stain for and see chlamydia under the microscope, that's not really the way it's diagnosed anymore. The test most commonly used is a type of NAAT, or N-A-A-T, standing for Nucleic Acid Amplification Test, 
which is just a fancy word for PCR. We'll illustrate the word gnat with these fly-like insects hovering around the treasure chests. Or gnats, but with a G. Okay, finally we get to the good stuff, the symptoms of infection. The symptoms depend on what type of chlamydia infects the patient. There are three types of chlamydia that we're going to talk about. Chlamydia trachomatis, the most commonly discussed, chlamydophila pneumoniae, and chlamydophila cytosy. Let's start with trachomatis. But to make it more confusing, trachomatis is divided into three groups as well, each denoted with a collection of letters, A through C, D through K, and L1 through L3. Let's start with the D through K, which is an STI, and it's the most commonly reported bacterial STI in the U.S. Representing this STI is going to be a mermaid at the head of the ship, she is a sexy female mermaid with a not-so-sexy STI. Never mind the mechanics of how a half-woman, half-fish may have gotten an STI. But the symptoms of the STI can vary or even remain asymptomatic, but you'll often hear of a watery discharge. You can remember this by remembering that the scene takes place in the water. And we'll also have this leak in the side of the ship here on the right and it's leaking or pouring out water to remind you of this watery discharge. This is in contrast to gonorrhea that has a mucopurulent or white discharge. One might think that those who don't have symptoms are lucky, but it's actually quite the opposite. Since they don't have symptoms, the infection can progress unnoticed to much worse things like pelvic inflammatory disease in females, or PID. We'll demonstrate this complication by flying the Jolly Rogers or this flag with a skull and crossbones. But don't these skull and crossbones kind of look like a uterus with fallopian tubes? PID is an ascending infection that can lead to cervicitis, salpingitis, pelvic pain, abscess formation, and scarring of the tubes that can cause infertility and ectopic pregnancies later in life. So it's important to treat these STDs as soon as possible. Anyway, back to our mermaid. You'll see she's holding onto a baby mermaid. And this is because if a woman has an active infection during delivery of a baby, the baby can potentially be infected with serovars D through K as well, but with a different presentation. The most common presentations would be neonatal conjunctivitis and neonatal pneumonia. This is demonstrated with the mermaid covering the baby's eyes for conjunctivitis, and also we'll give the baby a clamshell bra, and these clamshells are where the lungs would be, and we'll have some algae growing on the lungs to represent pneumonia. And if you recall from the Neisseria videos, this presentation can be seen in babies who are born to mothers with gonorrhea as well. But you'll still have to know a little trick to differentiate the two. The key is the time frame. Those with gonorrhea conjunctivitis will present earlier, like within the first two to four days. And remember in the gonorrhea video, we had the mother really quickly shielding the baby's eyes from the crime scene, that was to remind you of the short time frame. Those with conjunctivitis from chlamydia will present later, anywhere from one to two weeks later. And as far as the pneumonia goes, the common buzzword associated with neonatal pneumonia is that the babies will have a staccato cough, or a cough with really short, sudden bursts. Our next subgroup of chlamydia trachomatis are serovars L1 to L3. And this causes lymphogranuloma venarium, or LGV. This is known as an STD as well, but it's less common than D through K. LGV is an infection of the lymphatics, specifically of the inguinal nodes, and it starts out with a painless genital ulcer, similar to syphilis, but weeks to months later it presents as a tender lymphadenopathy with draining lymph nodes. We'll demonstrate this in the sketch by having a mermaid with several barnacles around the inguinal region. Remember that this sexy mermaid has STDs, and LGV is one of them. Okay, let's move on to our next subset of serovars, A through C. And this is associated with the disease trachoma. Trachoma is the leading cause of blindness in the whole world. You can remember the serovars are A, B, C, as in you see with your eyes. And we'll have trachoma be symbolized by our captain. You can see that he doesn't only have one eye patch, he actually has two. Those aren't sunglasses. And these are to symbolize blindness. And since he's the captain, he's the leader. So he's the leading cause of blindness worldwide. And we have one of his hands up, shielding the sun from his eye, to symbolize the transmission. It's actually hand-to-eye contact. 
though fomites can also transmit the bacteria as well. So that covers our general presentations of chlamydia. However, there are some other important points we need to bring up. I already mentioned PID being a long-term complication of chlamydia in women, but there's another group of complications that I haven't talked about yet, and that's reactive arthritis, or Reiter's syndrome. And these occur as a maladaptive autoimmune response. The body fighting the bacteria makes antibodies that cross-react and attack the body. The reactive arthritis most commonly manifests in the sacroiliac joint and the knee, though there are really several locations it can present in. If you look to the right of the ship, you see a pirate who's laughing and slapping his knee. This is meant to demonstrate reactive arthritis. You may remember seeing a slap knee character in the Campylobacter video. The reactive arthritis often comes with other symptoms as well, these being uveitis, or infection of the eyes, and urethritis. And altogether, they form the triad called Reiter's syndrome. We'll demonstrate the triad of symptoms with three monkeys. The first monkey is holding the telescope backwards, and he can't see through it, and that's because of uveitis. The monkey landing awkwardly on this bar can't pee, and this is because of urethritis. And the monkey struggling to climb this tree and now falling has arthritis. So can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree is a common mnemonic for Reiter's syndrome, and we've included it all in this drawing. Before we talk about treatment, we still have two more chlamydophilus species that we need to cover. You remember the neonatal pneumonia is associated with trachomatis. However, pneumonia from chlamydia can also happen in adults too, and this is from chlamydophila pneumoniae, or C. pneumoniae. The only thing you really need to know about chlamydophila pneumoniae is that it causes atypical pneumonia, or walking pneumonia, very much similar to mycoplasma and Legionella except that it's more common in the elderly as opposed to young adults. In the interest of time and your attention span, we'll leave it at that. We'll represent this pneumonia by giving our adult mermaid a clamshell bra. These clamshells are meant to look like her lungs, and we'll have some algae growing on these as well to represent pneumonia. Chlamydophila cidice also transmits pneumonia, but you need to remember that it's transmitted by birds, and oftentimes you'll see it's parrots. Question stems will usually mention pet store workers or bird owners and someone developing respiratory problems. In our sketch, we'll have a parrot pooping on the mermaid's lungs to represent this transmission. Okay, finally, we've made it to treatment. Luckily, the treatment of the bacteria with antibiotics is very effective. Recall that we said that the cell walls of chlamydia have no muramic acid? This makes penicillin and other antibiotics that target cell walls useless. Thus, an important treatment for chlamydia is macrolides, such as azithromycin. Not only can it treat the STI, but it can also treat trachoma as well. You should jot down a note that topical macrolides are not effective for chlamydial conjunctivitis in the newborn. You have to give them in oral form. So in our drawings, we'll add these crows at the top of the ship. These crows are a recurring symbol for macrolides. Another treatment option for chlamydia is tetracyclines, such as doxycycline. And doxycycline is demonstrated by our bicycle wheel, which we'll include here as their captain's steering wheel. And the atypical pneumonia, chlamydophila pneumonia, can also be treated with tetracyclines as first line, or macrolides as a second line. There is one more caveat to treatment, but it's definitely an important one. I can almost guarantee you'll get tested on it at some point. And to cover it, let's look back at our captain. Look at his hat. Does it look familiar? You may remember seeing it on Mac Private Eye in our Noir series video for Neisseria. We bring it up again because a frequently tested concept is the co-infection of chlamydia with gonorrhea. The two present almost identically and can be very hard to distinguish, and they often come together. This is why the empiric treatment for either of these two infections is to actually treat for both of them. So we'll also give them a single dose of ceftriaxone to cover a gonorrhea as well. And we symbolize ceftriaxone in numerous videos with our three axes, or triax. So we'll fly another flag with our triax symbol for ceftriaxone. Wow, that is a lot of information. You may need to watch it another time or two to make sure you fully register all of it. 
but between chlamydia being the most commonly reported bacterial STI in the US, and it also being the leading cause of blindness worldwide, it's kind of important. Alright, well best of luck.